morning, it's found in the Canadian Hymnal, page 661. We'll be reading Psalm 104, and that's Psalter Selection number 72. Page 661. Blessed be the Lord God my strength, which reacheth my hands, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? And it is like that evil, as they are, as they shadow, as they away. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down, touch the mountains, and they shall swim. <laughs> Send thine hand from above, rid me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strangers. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strangers whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. We'll continue our meditation on the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're looking at the 26th chapter now on the communion of the saints. We'll look at the first section of that chapter, which reads as follows. All saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. And being united to one another in love, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and the outward man. After considering the nature of the church, that which God has established in Jesus Christ and a place of fellowship for God's people, we look more particularly at the communion of the saints of course, here the idea of communion is not a reflection of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, but rather the fellowship of the people of God with each other. Uh, this is essential for the life of God's people, that we have fellowship with each other, that we draw near to God and to each other through faith, through mutual service. And so we now con consider the nature of this communion of the saints. What is the nature of the relationship that we have with each other? It's one of the blessings of a Christian church where uh, members know each other and have fellowship with each other. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, something out of the, uh, or <coughs> it is abnormal for churches to be places where large groups of people gather but nobody knows each other. They're all strangers to one another. Uh, we should know each other and be a part of each other's life. And so we're going to consider now the communion of the saints. We begin by noting that they are saints. And this once more reminds us that it, within Scripture, all the people of God are described as saints, or holy ones set apart for Christ. Uh, we are, are not among those who suggest that saints are reserved merely for those who do extraordinary works of uh, piety or godliness, but rather all the people of God are set apart for God. They're described as saints in Scripture. Of course, 
Paul and his letters, and just read the first few verses of uh, most of them, you'll see an, uh, a greeting sent to the saints in a particular city, the saints in Ephesus, the saints in Colossae, and so forth. So in Paul's mind, the church is filled with saints. So you are all saints, you who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that should be a motivation for us to love the saints and to be an encouragement to each one. We are saints by virtue of the fact that we are united to Jesus Christ. Uh, this reminds us again of the great theme of Scripture, and especially the Apostle Paul, that all that we have, all that we enjoy, comes to us through our union with Christ. And apart from that union with Christ, we have no true blessedness. We have no true happiness in life. Many who are outside of Christ, who are not living in covenant with Christ, not living by a vital faith in Christ, they might have much of what this world has to offer, but even in the abundance of things, there's not true life there. There's, there's not true blessedness there. But we who are united to Christ enjoy the favor of God and as many spiritual blessings in Him, as Paul outlined in Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is our head. We consider that Jesus is the head of the church uh, last time. Uh, he is the one who rules over the church and governs the church according to his will. So we're, we're, this is the one to whom we are united. We have his spirit at work within us. So there should be some evidence of the spirit's work producing fruit in our lives. Love, joy, uh, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All these many things should be uh, evident within our life. There should be a hunger for the Word of God, a delight in God. These are signs that we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And apart from that Spirit at work within us, we are not of Christ. We are not a part of His people. We are also saints uh, united to Christ by His by faith. So the Spirit is at work drawing us to Christ, including us in Christ, and then also by faith, we ourselves embrace Christ. <coughs> rest in him for our salvation. We have fellowship with Christ in his grace, his sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. We often think of perhaps our talents and gifts as something that is within ourselves, but here everything is united to Christ and comes to us through him. We have fellowship with him in his graces, so that is a wonderful blessing that we know his love, his favor, his kindness, his truth, all these many things, his power to assist us in godly living. But we also share in his sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. These are marks of our life as we suffer the afflictions of this life, not only the, the ordinary sufferings that come to us in view of our sin, but also in particular the sufferings that come to us uniquely because of our union with Christ and our fellowship with him. The ostracism of the world, the hostility of the wicked, and so you see bombings taking place and people uh, being crucified and all kinds of horrible things occurring because of our union with Christ. We have fellowship with him in his sufferings, in his death. And so there are some who indeed lose their lives in Christ. Uh, but we all experience fellowship with Christ in his death and that we are to die to self, die to sin, the pleasures of this world, and live for Christ and for his glory. And so... We have fellowship in his death and his resurrection. Here, death and life are at work within us at the same time. Death to sin on the one hand, life to God and Jesus Christ, life to the living in accord with the will of God. These are both at work within us at the same time. And of course, this resurrection life comes to fruition finally in our resurrection from the grave. And we have fellowship with Christ in his glory. Christ is glorified now. He is the king over all. He rules over all. And we have fellowship with him. We are seated with him in heavenly places, Paul says. And so we have union with Christ even in his glory. Uh, note the, the great centrality of the Christian faith in Christ and the various um, steps of his redemptive history. His, his graceful life, his sufferings, his death, resurrection, and his glorification, his ascension into heaven, which we are reminded of this past week, his ascension to heaven, <coughs> eternal glory, and we participate in all these stages. In glory, we uh, have fellowship with Christ in glory even now. And I 
hope to talk about that briefly uh, later this morning. And then also, certainly, in the great glory that is to come uh, when Christ returns in glory. So, these we have fellowship with in Christ. So, our communion begins with communion in Christ. And that lays the foundation for our communion with each other. And so, being united to one another in love, we have communion in each other's gifts as we're all united to Christ in these different ways. We have communion with each other's gifts and graces. Do you consider that the gifts that God has given to you are given for a purpose, to minister to others within the church? And so you have a responsibility for those gifts to use them to the glory of God in whatever way God has given them to you. Um, this is why for those who might not frequent worship services regularly, their gifts are being withheld from the life of the church. And our spiritual life is impoverished by, if you will, those who uh, are not attending regularly and faithfully. We have communion in each other's gifts and graces. So as we come to church, we come not only to receive the Word of God, to be taught, instructed, encouraged, and lifted up in God's Word, but also we have a responsibility to serve one another, to care for each other's needs, and to minister to each other in the way that God has gifted us and given us grace. So all of that is uh, important for our spiritual growth. We are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. And so there is an obligation on us who are joined and united to Christ and united to each other to fulfill our responsibilities by being an active part of the life of the church. Uh, we are to be engaged in those private and public duties. So public worship, private worship as well. Worship within our families, worship privately in our closet, if you will, uh, seeking God's favor in private. These produce our mutual good. So those who uh, are, are unable or unwilling to come to church lose the benefit of the fellowship of the saints, and those uh, also fail to produce the, the mutual good that is necessary within the whole life of the church. Well, this serves for both the inward and the outward man, spiritual life and the physical life. It's good for you physically to have fellowship with the saints. I can imagine that if you were to take a, a, a medical study to see the, the well-being of those who attend worship services, I would think that you would find that they are much healthier than those who do not do not have that time of rest and fellowship. Uh, fellowship with God's people is encouraging, delightful, uh, uplifting, and certainly a great relief to us both physically and spiritually.
26. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous. In the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. O Lord, your hand is lifted up, but they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let the fire for your adversaries consume them. O Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all our works. O Lord, our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone we bring to remembrance. They are dead. They will not live. They are shades. They will not arise. To that end, you have visited them with destruction and wiped out all remembrance of them. But you have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have enlarged all the borders of the land. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your spirit and the illuminating that word to our hearts. We pray that you would be at work among us, that you would strengthen us in your uh, glorious work in this day. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us to trust in you and enjoy the peace that you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. I'm told that the city of Manchester in England has security cameras everywhere. It has more cameras than any other city throughout England than, uh, than any other city in England but the city of London. So security is not so much of an issue, or is it? In fact, with the, the event that took place this past week where a young man takes a knapsack filled with explosives and walks to uh, a, a stadium where a concert with young girls, for the most part, was uh, gathering and blows himself up. This young man had already a, a history behind him and there were multiple uh, attempts to alert authorities, even within the Islamic community, about this one as one who had turned toward terrorism and one who was making terroristic threats. They themselves were concerned about him. He was kicked out of his own mosque. And so there was plenty of warning, and with all the security cameras around, they still did not stop this one from gaining access to the stadium. What is more, witnesses at the, the stadium or the Coliseum uh, noted that there was a, a obvious lack of security there. There seemed to be no interest in examining people's bags other than to see if there was a bottle of water in them or something like that. And so the, uh, uh, the sense of security there was very lax. Perhaps they were overconfident in all of the layers of protection that were outside uh, the stadium. 
You can never really have faith in the city, the cities of men, that you will be secure. There's always something that can bring danger to you. The only place where there is great security is in the city of God. The scriptures tell us the tale of two cities throughout the pages. The cities of this world, really, you might bring them all together and say the city of man. Uh, you have kind of a, a historical example of that in the Tower of Babel, where men built a city and a tower up to the heavens. And they thought that by this they would be united and preserved. They would be saved from harm. That was uh, autonomous man asserting himself in uh, rebellion against God as creator, that he himself can protect himself as best as he can and pursue the heavens in the way that he desires. There's a city of man on the one hand, with all its many different manifestations. Then there is the city of God. And Isaiah here in this chapter directs the attention of his people to this city of God, this spiritual kingdom. I think by reviewing the chapter and reading through it, it becomes evident that Isaiah is not merely talking about historic Jerusalem, that city set on a hill uh, years ago. Uh, the descriptions that he gives there are descriptions that are spiritual in nature, more so than physical. There is a reference to the gates of the city, but that's about all the reference to this city that there is. There's walls and bulwarks, but they're described as salvation. God's great saving acts on behalf of his people. The city of God is a place where the righteous enter and where they experience peace. This is a strong city, a city that God has placed for his people. And so Isaiah seeks to encourage the people of God in the midst of a, a, a troublesome world. In fact, just nearby, the cities of the Moabites have been devastated. And God's judgments had come upon the cities of Moab. You can read about that a little bit in the previous chapter. And so here, the, these who thought that they were secure in their lofty cities found that there is no security in this world. Jerusalem itself would come under destruction in, in years after Isaiah and after Jeremiah. The city would be destroyed in about 586 B.C., it would be destroyed and sacked again in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Um, it was a city that would be subject to attack from time to time. Isaiah points the people of God to a much greater city, a city who also, that also had roots uh, within the people of God throughout the centuries. Remember, the writer of the Hebrews talks about Abraham and his experience as he left Ur of the Chaldeans and settled into the promised land. He says he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't looking for an earthly city so much as a heavenly city. God has a city like this for his people, and he directs their attention to that great city, the city of God. When we look at this text, if I can take a moment to analyze it for you, you have the opening introduction to the, the text in the first verse that a, this song will be sung. And so what occurs following the first verse is a, some poetry uh, in poetic form uh, through the remainder of the chapter. This is the song that is sung. Uh, this uh, introduction sets the place for, for what we have before us here is a song that the people of God would sing, perhaps as they would approach the city of Jerusalem on their uh, feasts, their celebrations, and they would sing this great song. Of course, singing songs has a great history in the people of God. Uh, we noted before that when uh, God delivered his people from the Egyptian armies and Pharaoh, they sang the song of Moses. Miriam picked up her tambourine and, and sang this great song of the Lord's deliverance. And this is a mark of the people of God. We sing. One of the great joys of God's people is the singing of the great acts of salvation on our behalf. And so, singing is very much a part of the life of the church. It would be interesting, and I don't know the answer to this, but it would be interesting to see what, what place music has within the sanctuaries of the mosque, of the Hindu temple, of the Buddhist shrines. Do they sing? 
I'm not aware of that. Christians sing. I'm reminded, and I've been going through uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Fellowship of the Ring, again, and listening to it on Audible. Uh, and they had the, the hobbits singing a variety of songs, or, or the elves singing songs. And if you ever heard an elf singing a song, it's kind of an unusual experience. Especially in, on, on Audible, where you have one person singing all these different parts. But singing is a part of the life history of God's people. We rejoice in that which God has provided. And so this song is given to the disciples of the Lord to instruct them and encourage them to have faith in their God. And the, the faith is to be placed in this great city. But again, I, I think he has more than just Jerusalem in mind because Jerusalem in a hundred years or so would be sacked and destroyed. In fact, during after Isaiah's day, the Assyrians would come up to the city and lay siege to it. They would not be able to sack it, but they, they attacked the city. Um, so it seems to me that Isaiah has something more in mind than really the, the physical city itself and, and the inhabitants thereof. He was very critical of the inhabitants of the city of his day. You might recall that elsewhere in the Psalms, Psalms 46 and 48, you have celebration of the great city of God, uh, Mount Zion, uh, where God dwells. And this is the, the great hope of the people of God, that there is this wonderful city that will be laid up for us. In fact, when you go on into the New Testament, of course, the, the very goal of history is a city. And so when you look at the scriptures from beginning to end, you have the beginning of a garden to which we are to cultivate, and, and we are called to subdue the earth, and the goal of history is a city, a cultivated city, where the people of God exist in the presence of God. And the, the, the book of Revelation concludes with this great city of Jerusalem coming down from heaven like a bride adorned for her husband and, and uh, resting upon the earth. This is the goal of history, this great city of God to which we are all headed. And so Isaiah points us to this great city. He says so, now, we have in the first verse an introduction in verses 2 through uh, 8, excuse me, through 7, 2 through 7, you have uh, a description of this strong city. Why is it strong? And verses 8 and 9, you have uh, kind of the response of the people of God in view of the strength of the city that we will wait upon the Lord. We desire and yearn for the Lord. And so a, a view of the city of God and all of its provisions will lead us to desire God more fully. And so in anticipation of this great city, what God has done should produce within us this great yearning for God. But then in verses uh, 10 and 11, you have uh, the contrast uh, first uh, against the city of of God, the city of men, where they do not understand the judgments of God in history. They reject them and, and don't make, they don't make any sense to them. You have Paul's description of the natural man as looking at spiritual things and being confused by them. They don't make any sense to him. Uh, Isaiah says much the same thing in these verses 10 and 11, where uh, the, uh, the Moabites and, and, and the natural man sees the judgments of God upon the city of man and it doesn't make any sense to him. He does not learn or profit from it. He dwells in the land of righteousness, and yet he still performs corrupt things. And so he, he's got blessings around him that come to him from God. He lives in God's world. God rules over all things and, and showers him with many blessings, but he doesn't benefit from it. He continues on in this way, in his wickedness, such as the hardness of the darkened heart. Then you have the conclusion of, of the text in verses 12 through 15, as I'm, I'm considering it this morning, where there is a reassertion of this peace that God gives to his people, and the peace that secures their hearts, uh, that peace which God himself has provided for his people, it is their stay. And uh, they're, they're comforted in knowing that God's kingdom will advance through history and time, and will include all of God's elect. So here is 
Isaiah's description of this great city, a strong city, a powerful city. Why is this city strong? Well, it's strong because of the one who dwells within it, the God of heaven who dwells among his people and blesses his people in so many different ways. God is the strength of his people. He uh, closed the walls of the city with salvation. Uh, in the text, literally, is he, he sets salvation for its walls and, and bulwarks. Um, it, this is the work of God, producing salvation for the people of God. And this is what gives us security. Sometimes you may have heard the phrase, uh, once saved, always saved. Um, God produces salvation and he brings us to himself and there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. We are secure in Christ. And so this great salvation that we have in Christ is something that gives us great security. And that, I think, is what Isaiah is really focused on, the security of the people of God. This city is strong, and so we can be secure within the life of that city. God has provided salvation to surround that city. And if God saves the city, then who can oppose that great work? So we have the presence of God within the city, the salvation that he provides. You have the gift of righteousness that he gives to his people. God himself provides righteousness to them. And then they respond with faithful living. The righteousness that, they, that Isaiah speaks of is not the righteousness of the saints that they themselves work within themselves by a good life, that sort of thing. It's the gift of God that's given to them. And then out of that gift of righteousness, they then live faithful lives. It's not enough for us to simply come into a church and make a public profession of faith and then live the way we please for the rest of life. We need to follow the Lord and walk in faithfulness to his covenant and his ways. And so the blessings of that great city include the gift of righteousness to his people, uh, and then second, the gift of peace. God's peace will cover their hearts and make them feel secure. What a blessing to know that our warfare with God has been concluded. It's been done away with. We have peace with God. And this peace dwells within our hearts and gives us a peace that passes understanding. It's more profound than really the absence of conflict. The scripture's peace is a positive thing. It's a joy and delight in the presence of God. And this is the peace that we have in Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, but my peace I give to you. He is the one who has overcome the world by his death on the cross for us. And so we have peace with God within this glorious city. And further, we have righteousness, peace, and faith. We trust in the Lord. We can rest securely in that which he's given to us. And so one of the marks of the people of God is a life of faith. We can trust in the Lord. He is our rock. He is our source of security and strength. And so we have the presence of God and the blessings of God that make us a strong city, a place of God's abode. And so the righteous, as they approach God's city, find that the pathway to that city is level, has been provided for them in Jesus Christ. It's smooth, it's easy as we enter into that glorious city. As we approach that city, Isaiah uses the image of the pilgrimage where they come to the city gates and say, open to the gates, open the gates, that the righteous uh, nation may enter into it. Uh, God provides us with uh, an entrance into his glorious city in the course of life. And for that, we are grateful. And so there is this strong city that God has given to us. It's strong because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has accomplished our great salvation. He's the one who has bound the strong man and if he binds a strong man, then he must be stronger than the strong man. Satan is a strong man, and Jesus has bound him. There is therefore no greater power than Jesus Christ. And he rules in that great power now. His ascension into heaven, his being established upon the throne above, means that he is in power now. And so the city of God is even more powerful than, than ever because we have the risen Lord Jesus Christ 
John in glory above, ruling over us. He is the mighty God. And out of his hands, no one can snatch us. We also become strong and mighty in him. We have uh, the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ at work within us. We are raised to new life. We are empowered now to live for God. We have this new power within us so that we as citizens of this great city are made strong in Jesus Christ. We have the Spirit of God at work within us, giving us power. Power to live for God. Power to overcome sin and temptation. Power to do that which is right and good. We have that great power within us. This is the great work of the Spirit of God in the midst of His church. So we have the presence of God within his church. We have the gifts of God that sustain us in righteousness, peace, and faith. We have Christ as the one who has secured all these things for us through his death and resurrection. And we rejoice in them as we are united to Christ. And we have this great power at work within our minds. The psalmist then, or excuse me, Isaiah then, turns to encourage us to embrace this strong city for ourselves and to wait upon the Lord, to rest upon him for his protection and provision in the course of life. Wait on the Lord. That means that when we look at the experiences that we have in life and things don't always go the way we had hoped, which is most often the case, I'm afraid, we find that we, we can do one of two things. One, we can say, well, it's just not working out, so I'll do things my own way. Then we find that that way brings us into trouble. Or we can wait on the Lord and wait on His provision and wait for Him to, to, to make His provision for us. The people of God wait for God. Wait for Him to take care of them. And so, we wait. We wait in hope. Isaiah speaks of this great vision of the future for God's people, that there is this great city, and he places it before them as a, a thing for their hope. They can look ahead to that great city and yearn for that. Well, the conclusion of, of this is that we have peace with God, that he establishes us in that great peace. Uh, in a world of terror and conflict, we can know peace with God, and we can know that God is our salvation. This week, as I uh, left my home uh, one evening, I was uh, heading out to see Mike, and it was raining out that particular night, pouring rain, and as I got out of the house and headed to my, my uh, Jeep, I saw, uh, wandering about in the, the street, a, a young boy about nine years of age, as I learned uh, afterwards. He was dripping wet. He had no raincoat, no hat, or anything. He was dripping wet in the pouring rain. He's walking around like this in the middle of the street. So I, I said, are you okay? He said, no, I think I'm lost. I said, well, come here and tell me, where's your home? Do you know what your address is? And he, he told me, and I, in my mind, I couldn't figure out where exactly that was at. So I, I decided that I would call for the police. I called 911 and asked for a car to come and to take him home. And uh, indeed, as we sat there, I got him a towel. We stood outside my porch, and I got him a towel, got him dried off a little bit. I offered him my coat, but he didn't feel like he was particularly cold. And finally, the police officer arrived in, in this nice Jeep. He steps out of the Jeep, and this young officer is just fit, you know, and very handsome, and he, he looked like he was a father, and he just what to do for this boy. He comes up in a very happy, friendly way and takes care of the boy and asks him where his home was and everything. And, uh, I was just so impressed by this officer and uh, the gifts that God has given him for this special occasion to, to rescue this boy and to take him home, drive him home. In this story, we see something of what God must do for us. We are wandering about in the street, lost, at the mercy of the elements, the first thing we need to recognize, however, is that we are lost and we need help. Except we come to that point in our life where we recognize that I am indeed lost. 
And I need help beyond what I can do because I don't know where I'm at. Unless you come to that point in your life, you cannot find the peace, the salvation, the strong city that God has brought, provided for his people. So take note of this boy and take the kinds of steps that he took. He was willing to listen. He's willing to have me help him out, to take care of him for a little bit, then to get someone who could truly help him. For us, Jesus Christ is the one who rescues us, who brings us safely to home. And it's our calling, our responsibility as believers to find those who are lost and to rescue them. To see our neighbors and friends in this very same situation in life. And to do what we can to say, are you okay? Are you okay? Sit down with them and have a, a, a meaningful conversation with them, not just about baseball and, and politics and uh, these kinds of things, but are you okay? And lead them to Jesus Christ, the one who is strong to save, mighty to save. <clears throat> That's our calling. That's our responsibility. That's our joy. And I rejoice in seeing this young boy taken off and, and taken care of. Uh, as he got into the one police officer's jeep, I saw another police officer pull up behind, so it was very secure. Everything was going to be taken care of. And I could go on my way without a second thought about him. I knew he was safe. That's right. Father, we pray for our loved ones, our family members, our friends, who are not a part of this glorious city of God, this one which is yet to come, but yet is uh, present in our midst even today. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be uh, alert to those who are lost and help us, O oh Lord, to gather them into your glorious city to bring them to the Savior, Jesus Christ, who can uh, take them, uh, clean them up, and bring them home. We pray for your blessing on us, and that you would help us to walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's Word by bringing before Him our morning times and times.
use them for your glory and for the advance of your kingdom in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. It's time to turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to him and conclude with the Lord's prayer. We thank you for our time together this morning and ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 